just in case I haven't made my point abundantly clear by now, Final Fantasy X is one of the worst, most annoying goddamn games I ever played in my life. The story is fucking wretched, the characters are vapid, irritating dill holes, the art and costume design are ridiculous to the point of weeping hilarity, and the plot's got holes in it you could drive a shoe puff through. And it also won a shit ton of awards from virtually every gaming website and magazine on the planet, and is one of the best-selling, most highly reviewed RPGs of all time. So of course, because I live on a planet full of mouth-breathing butt-whistlers who wouldn't know a good plot to an RPG if it dick-whipped them in the goddamn eye, Square Enix granted your wish and made a sequel. Final Fantasy X-2. You could kiss my ass for starters. How about going to hell and taking this fucking game with you? <laughs> Ain't nobody sticking up for this piece of shit, is there? Even fans of 10 didn't know what to make of this. I mean, what the fuck is going on here? It's just, I, I, I don't even know what I'm looking at here. There's singing and... Was anybody really expecting this after Final Fantasy X? What is with this awful, poorly translated, meaningless J-pop, and why is Yuna dancing all of a sudden, and why is Riku a main character now, and I don't even know who the hell that's supposed to be. You spend most of the game looking for new clothes to wear? I'm not even kidding. A major focus of this game is running around and finding lots of sexy outfits. It's all just really goofy, like silly kid shit with a bunch of wacky posing for no reason. And then there's this guy. Let's go! Party! Party! But you know what? I get it. No, really. I get what they were trying to do. Hell, I kind of admire this game in a weird way. They were trying to do something new, fresh, and unique. They were trying to inject just a little bit of fun and spirit into what had become a relatively dull, grim, formulaic, and predictable series. Up to this point, the series featured a lot of brooding, whiny, socially awkward assholes full of self-doubt, and lots of very linear storytelling, and believe me, it doesn't get much more linear than Final Fantasy X. X-2, on the other hand, is a very lighthearted adventure with proactive, enthusiastic characters, relatively strong and confident female protagonists, lots of new and upbeat music, and a big emphasis on side questing and exploration. This is basically a sandbox Final Fantasy game with days of playing time worth of side content to discover. Although the act of exploration might have been just a little bit more exciting if you, you know, actually flew the airship around Spirit to see it for yourself instead of just selecting your destination off a list. But I applaud that kind of innovation! I mean, how weird is that, right? I'm the one guy actually offering a defense for this game. In fact, if I'm being embarrassingly honest, I... I kinda like it. I like it better than fucking 10. At least this game had an identity. You must admit, it did put a new spin on a relatively dull, very tired, very predictable series. Granted, it didn't work here, like, at all, to the point that even hardcore fans have completely rejected this game, but I think I know why. No, well, yes, kind of. This is really the scene that caused almost everyone to turn their consoles off in disgust immediately. It's the first thing we see in this game, and it's all just... Oh god, this is stupid. I mean, what the fuck is that thing? Why is the stage some kind of techno force field head grinning drumming Buddha looking thing? And the song is annoying, the lyrics don't make any sense, and it's that kind of horrible song that gets stuck in your head for weeks. And are we playing a ditzy pop music singer in this game? Because that doesn't really sound like Final Fantasy. It sounds like bullshit. It sounds like Britney's dance beat. And fuck that. But more than that, the game's just all way too girly and Charlie's Angels and there's there's dress spheres and I don't even know what the fuck Hypellos are and there's a ton of side quests and all this pop music and Yuna runs like a girl and you have to dress like a Moogle and there's a shitload of fan service. If you look at it from a fan standpoint, this just isn't a Final Fantasy game because they change too much. Again, I like change, I like innovation, but when you change too much, it becomes unrecognizable as a game in the series, and people get mad. When you go overboard trying to reinvent Final Fantasy, it stops being innovation and becomes... well, 
Betrayal! What? Betrayal! Uh-huh. You see, are we starting to understand each other just a little bit by now? Now, before you start thinking I'm going soft on this game, oh, it sucks. Believe me, it sucks the shit ring off my toilet, but despite what I said, it's not really about playing dress up. It's really about finding- No! No! Not him! Damn it! Not fucking Titus! Fuck that shit pistol! I hate Titus! Anyone with a working gag reflex hated that whiny fudge plumber, and now the whole game is spent trying to get him back? No! What kind of fucking incentive is that, bringing back Titus? That's like entering a costume contest where the winner gets a fucking tetanus shot. I am not very fucking motivated here, people. So, you know what they added in a desperate attempt to hold your interest? Fan service. Lots of fucking fan service. And what, you may ask, is fan service? Oh yeah, that's the spot. Oh, right there. Yes, don't stop. Ugh. <sighs> For now, let's just say a major part of this game is putting the girls in sexy, revealing outfits. Yuna goes from wearing very conservative clothes in the last game to a short skirt dress when she's singing, and her default costume includes boy shorts. But even that seems mild and modest compared to Riku, who's barely wearing anything at all except for a bikini top and a micro miniskirt with visible thong. But at least for modesty's sake, she's wearing a... scarf? I call slut, but at least this fan service is really covering all the bases. I mean, there's variety, if nothing else. We've got the slutty Lolita jailbait, the demure but bi curious sheltered girl. But you know, I really like the dark, brooding goth chicks. Uh, girls who wear all leather, have a lot of self doubt, don't say much and mope all the time. If only there was a female version of Squall from Final Fantasy VIII, but with big titties so I could harbor secret fuck fantasies about him, but without it being gay. It's a little late to be bringing that up. Viva Rule 63! She's even got a pretentious emo name, Pain. I can almost hear the Evanescence playing whenever she's on camera. Okay, so the game starts off with Yuna giving a pop concert. Riku and Pain immediately jump the stage with swords and attempt to kill everybody. And at least this I can get behind because this music is a diabolical atrocity that must be stopped at once by any means necessary. Want in on this number? Then show me your moves! I love how Yuna just completely disregards the two Amazons gruesomely slaughtering her backup dancers with medieval weaponry. She just turns her back on them and shakes her ass. I mean, okay, I know it's not really Yuna, but Jesus, people are getting cut in half up here. Not even Guar goes as far as outright murder. Usually. Once you've murdered her backup dancers, fake Yuna runs outside while her stereotyped goons run interference, and finally we meet the real Yuna, who's ditched her summoner staff for a pair of handguns, making her the first sensible protagonist in the history of this frigging series since Laguna carried a rifle. It's worth noting, though, that she hits absolutely nothing with this little stunt before they all strike a triumphant Power Rangers pose. Oh my god, this is so cheesy quite a long way from the traditional kimono she wore before, and her previous characterization as a kind, demure, religious caregiver with a tragic fate. But is this huge change in outfit and characterization because of the radical cultural shift in spirit because of the exposure of Yevon as a maniacal, genocidal cult run by the undead bent on world domination? Or just because Japanese perverts wanted to see some cleavage and her cute ass in boy shorts? Good question. The answer is yes. <laughs> Speaking of cleavage, check this shit out. The fake Yuna is revealed to be someone named LeBlanc in some kind of holographic disguise. You give us back Yuni's garment grid right now! Very well, it's yours. <clears throat> Her true form is that of... You know, I don't even know how to describe it. An exotic fan dancer with a plunging neckline that plunges so far, you can see your thong. A lot of double-sided tape went into this outfit. So here's what drives the story and the combat in Final Fantasy X-2, the Dress Spheres. It's some kind of ancient holographic technology that allows the girls to change clothes in a very elaborate flowery transformation sequence. Each outfit you get grants a different set of powers which work like jobs from earlier Final Fantasy games. Yuna now has the Songstress Dress Sphere, which lets you do exotic dances that cause status effects on monsters like blindness. This is a little embarrassing. Yes. She dances so poorly it causes people to go blind. Who could possibly do a dance so horrifying it blinds people? Oh god, no! Why do I ask these questions? Why, French Conan? Keep your thong on my eyes! God! Oh, back to the game! 
Man, this dress fear thing, I just don't get any of this. It doesn't make any sense. And why is this even a fight? LeBlanc's fighting one on three against people armed with swords and firearms. And a microphone. I don't know. She's wielding a fucking fan! And why did she give the garment grid back to Yuna if she was just planning on killing her anyway? And why did LeBlanc steal the garment grid in the first place? To do a concert? To look like Yuna? Why does the garment grid change LeBlanc's physical appearance to look exactly like Yuna? And how did LeBlanc know it does that, when every other time it's used for anyone else, it just changes your clothes? And it somehow creates firearms, robot suits, and 40-pound buster swords out of thin air. I mean, it can do that? How? This garment grid thing bugs the shit out of me, because it's one of those things I'm just supposed to accept blindly without any explanation, and I need one! What are the garment grids, like a science or magic or what? Why does changing clothes grant me completely different skill sets and or magic powers? Why do I forget how to use a sword or forget how to use black magic just because I happen to have changed clothes? What, does the dress sphere completely rewrite your brain chemistry like in The Matrix? Well, it certainly seems to when Yuna starts dancing uncontrollably. Wouldn't that scare the shit out of you? That can happen when you use the garment grid. The emotions of the person recorded in the sphere pass to the user. Isn't that dangerous? I can't really say. But it's your invention. All right, wait, I just, I don't get this. So the kid invented the garment grid and spheres contain emotions? <sighs> okay, how? Why? What are spheres anyway? I mean, what's their function? What are they made of? And how are they recorded? And with what? And how do they contain emotions? How is that even possible? And th the kid's name is Shinra? As in Shinra from Final Fantasy VII? But th th that's impossible. I mean, aren't they completely different stories? Right? <laughs> Okay, but if they are in the same continuity, does that make Final Fantasy X-2 a prequel to Seven? Wh why? And what does that accomplish? And what? It just... It, okay, if Shinra invented the garment grid, how come I find other garment grids in treasure chests hidden in ancient temples built long before Shinra was born? I just... It, uh, oh god, somebody help me! I just... I, I, I don't know what's going on, and my brain is melting, and I haven't been even playing for an hour yet! <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake, the Albed language shit again? They expect you to go tracking down the translation markers again? Go digging in the Beaconel Desert. Expose yourself to the language as much as possible. Expose yourself to my cock! I already did this shit the last fucking game, and I didn't care that time either! Hell, Riku's one of the core characters! She's an Albed! She knows the fucking language! She grew up speaking the fucking language! Go digging in the Beaconel Desert. Go digging in my shit for corn! Why can't I just ask Riku to teach me the fucking language? It's her native fucking language! And besides, do you really think this guy is spilling some mind-blowing secrets to fucking enlightenment in this scene to warrant a second fucking playthrough? Fuck you! Fuck your busy work! Mishuna, what can I do for you? Oh, Jesus, I forgot about the blue Jar Jar fuckers. Fuck these guys, too! Our Barky is a high power. No one knows his real name, so everyone just calls him Barky. That is a problem. Let me see if I can solve that one. Ask him his fucking name! God damn it! <sighs> so the premise is that Yuna and the others are sphere hunters. And by sphere hunters, I basically mean thieves in the same way that Indiana Jones is an archaeologist. Only the stuff the Gullwings are after is by and large valueless crap. Treasure sphere waves, they're coming from those ruins they found at Gagazet. Okay, so spheres emit waves of what? Hey, the rocks are floating! Don't tell me we gotta climb up that thing! No worries, I'll take you to the top. <laughs> okay, so by take you to the top, he means push you out of the fucking airship to fall 60 feet onto the narrowest, most dangerous precipice imaginable. It's a miracle they all just didn't die right there. Yuna faints from vertigo immediately, and the girls catch her as she falls. Disasterific! Disasterific is not a word. Okay, no, no, I'm not counting ass shots anymore. Before it was just a funny quirk of the game's direction. Here, it's intentional fan service. They pull Yuna back onto the ledge and run into LeBlanc and her cronies again. And get used to me saying that. Uh, LeBlanc, remember that name well, loves.
It turns out the LeBlanc Syndicate's a rival group of Sphere Hunters, but really they just come off as a less threatening version of Team Rocket because all they do is show up every 30 minutes to get their asses kicked. Prepare for trouble! Make it double! Once you beat them down again, they run off, and then it's a race to the top of the mountain to get the sphere. Wait, hang on. I thought the guy flying the airship promised he was taking us to the top. No worries. I'll take you to the top. I mean, that's not something one should easily screw up. The top should be relatively easy to find. It's an unambiguous measure of altitude. Go as high as possible. That's the top. And how did LeBlanc get to the summit of Mount Gagazette at virtually the same time as the Gullwings when she doesn't have an airship? I mean, it's clear on the other side of the continent, and the Gullwings have the only airship in existence. Well, when you get to the top, you find all three of them hanging from a ledge helplessly. How did they get there? Would you, would you stop staring? And instead of saving them, you just walk on like you don't see nothing. I mean, wow. You can't even attempt to save them from falling to their deaths if you wanted to. You aren't given an option. Look at this. I'm just gonna loot their fucking treasure chest right in front of them and walk off laughing. Like a boss. That is cold as ice. When you reach the top of the mountain, you find the sphere, but predictably it's guarded by a boss monster. A giant enemy crab. Sadly, it has no weak point you can attack for massive damage, but it's pretty easy anyway, and you finally get a hold of this wave-radiating sphere and take a look at its contents. worth the trouble! I am so glad we risked our lives on that fucking mountain tracking that thing down! It's not very exciting. Junk. You scored the Black Mage dress sphere- wait, Black Mage? I, was there a Black Mage in that sphere? Was there a Black Mage recording the sphere? The hell is going on? No sooner do you finish watching that sphere that sensors detect two more of them. I guess they weren't emitting enough sphere waves before, but now they are. Fucking sphere waves. There's at least one on Pisaid Island, and another in the Xanarkand Ruins. Really? You didn't think to check Xanarkand for spheres about Titus? You know, the guy who comes from Xanarkand? The guy who never shut the fuck up about being from fucking Xanarkand that entire fucking game? And that wasn't the first fucking place you looked? One of the greatest machina-using civilizations in the world's history with millions of fucking people in it, and it just now occurred to you to look at fucking Xanarkand? Fuck, this is stupid! Oh god, I hate this fucking game! Deep Wang! So you go to fucking Besaid Island to get the sphere out of there and check up on Waka and Lulu's new baby because all those treasure sphere waves being emitted from there can't be good for a child. I'm sorry, I just, I can't get over the sphere waves. <gasps> Waka, a daddy! And yeah, store that thought away for a future nightmare. Waka ejaculating and creating a new life form. I mean, how do I know how a father's supposed to act in front of his kid? Here's a free one. Stop styling your hair like a quail's head. This scene establishes why Payne is here to replace Lulu, who's now pregnant with Waka's freak seed. Great maternity wear, Lulu. She's still wearing the same ridiculous clothes now. And actually, now that I think about it, since she's pregnant, does that mean her boobs are actually gonna get bigger? Minor tangent, but just looking around, the world is reacting with surprising calm to learn their entire global religion was a genocidal lie for a thousand years. I'd expect Waka at least to have some major mental problems. That guy was a serious Yevon freak. <laughs> oh god, Yevon lied to me, huh? I believed in you! I've got this key with the emblem of Besaid on it. How did- 900,000 gil?! Eat my tits! This ain't exactly a mid-condition copy of Action Comics number one, you know. The fuck do I care about a key? I'll be back. Heading out to find the sphere, you get to see all the new monsters this game has to offer. Like, no new monsters at all, just the exact same dogs and evil scoops of ice cream we fought the entirety of the last game. You know, I highly doubt they came up with more than five or six original monsters since the previous game, aside from palette swapping other monsters. Eventually you find a bunker locked with a passcode, where I think this game could have perhaps saved itself by crossing over with the Fallout universe. Alas, no. You find the sphere inside, which is naturally guarded by a boss. Find the sphere and the fiends appear. Actually, yeah, what is it with these spheres attracting fucking arch demons to protect them? What do monsters care about spheres except for the fact that they're shiny? 
The way these things attract big badass monsters, you'd think people would want them as far away from themselves as possible, or even destroyed outright. I don't know, well, let's see the sphere, I guess. I mean, the first one was a dud, but they gotta get better from here, right? I'm, s I'm sorry, how exactly are we making money doing this again? I mean, what the fuck was that? That was 10 seconds of a staticky waterfall. Great job, guys! Let's throw this shit on eBay! Our retirement's secure! Oh, but which, what am I thinking? We couldn't possibly sell this. It belongs in a fucking museum! I know everything. Okay, smartass! How do we get Titus back? I'm just a kid. Kid is seriously starting to piss me off. You go to Xanarkin next, which has become a tourist attraction in the two years since you've been there. A tourist attraction with deadly ninjas and snakes made of miniguns. And it seems you're not the only group of sphere hunters with designs of plundering the ancient ruins. We're sphere hunters! The Kitchen Guardians! Oh my god! I could have gone to med school and instead I played this fucking game! I just, I can't... It's so stupid! How does this series even have fans? I just, I, I can't, I You're watching this, right? I implore you. Am I wrong? The Kindergardians tell you they have part of some password, which is key, and it's not long before you find a ninja on a radio who tells you the other part. Oh, hey, I wanted to double check that clue. It's Mon, right? Nah, it's just that I heard some kids saying it was key. It's Monkey. <laughs> yeah, I figured it was Mon. Over and out. Put it together, fuck pump, it's Monkey. The clues are Key and Mon. It's Monkey! How do you not get this? Key Mon? It's Monkey! Monkey! You vapid whores! Monkey! Ah! Oh my god! Monkey! Ah! Monkey! What unholy terror is this? It's like she's possessed by a demon or she's become some kind of wooden puppet. The eyes, they're flat and lifeless like a doll's eyes. And what is with the lip flaps? Monkey! It's like the word monkey's got six syllables all of a sudden. Monkey! Oh, and speaking of monkeys, we should get something out of the way right now. It has to do with the subquests. This game is full of subquests. In fact, Subquests probably compose the majority of the game's content. There's optional dungeons, lots of those, huge ones to unlock limit breaks, additional powers, and really bizarre dress spheres like the Lady Luck, Gun Mage, Trainer, and the Mascot, all of which you'll probably never use. And there's Blitzball. Oh god, is there a fuckload of Blitzball because I couldn't get enough of that in the first fucking game. There's Sphere Break, which will probably take about 20 hours and cause you to eat your controller in rage. There's monster hunting, there's chasing butterflies, there's puzzles, there's chocobo ranching. And as for monkeys, there's also a subquest where you have to pair up dozens of monkeys in the Xanarkin ruins so they can all have babies. Look, I can put up with an insane amount of bullshit from Square. I played the bouncer for fuck's sake, but I refuse to put up with a fantasy RPG that seriously expects me to play for a fucking hour running back and forth trying to get monkeys to fuck. So yeah, I don't give a crap about the subquests in this game, and I didn't waste my time doing hardly any of them. It's not like you need them. They're really just there for the most obsessive of completionists, and the people who want to attempt to get the special ending you get for 100% completion of the game, which is basically impossible to do, even if you know what you're doing, have a strategy guide in your lap as you play it, and even then, it'll still probably take you two complete playthroughs to do it. Do you even know how easily you can get fucked over if you're going for 100% completion? If you do every single thing there is to do in this game but miss one piece of dialogue, 99%, no special ending. One line of dialogue the game deems important in 50, 60 hours of gameplay. And that includes random people in town who just shout stuff you have no reason to talk to. If you miss one, 99%. If you leave the screen before their text bubbles disappear on their own, 99%. You'll never know what you missed either or where. So, 100% completion? I got three words for you. YouTube and fuck that. Trust me, it's not worth it. Oh, but I'll show it to you anyway. Stay tuned for part two. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to use my penis on something. Am I stealing your spot? Yes, sir. Can you play so many
shitty games When you pass out of East Hill on the drive My movie director was party on crime The Spoonie is the only man going back Spoonie X Fairy Man This can't be happening. This, this cannot be my life. 